thanks for coming here uh, to talk with Travis from Tourradar. Um, it's my pleasure to interview him. We've been a seed investor in Tourradar, uh, one of the first uh, people who bet money on that. Uh, and you had quite a journey uh, up until now, founded in 2010. Uh, did a Series B last year, what in the US is probably a Series A, right? Uh, 10 million. Uh, and um, yeah, there was some joint journey in between that. So can you maybe start with what was the initial idea and, and what happened on the way to that Series B? Sure, thanks a lot guys. Um, pleasure to be here. So Travis is my name, co-founder and CEO of Tourator. Um First of all, what is Tourator? you might be asking. Uh, we're a marketplace tackling probably the last frontier of the travel industry uh, to be actually digitized and brought online. So uh, multi-day tours is what we sell. Think of a, a Inca Trail trek or a Tanzania Kilimanjaro trek or a 14-day coach tour around Europe where you have a guide, you have a group, you have transport accommodation, quite a complex product, but a high basket size. So $2,000 is the average, and 14 days is the, the trip length on average uh, that are sold. Uh, it's called a, a niche, it's a $50 billion niche, uh, so it's actually still pretty decent sized market to go for, um, but the journey started out much different to where we are today. Uh, so when we first began, uh, we started out on the meta search model. Uh, so we actually aggregated 500 different companies into our platform uh, and then actually had partners who would get traffic, we'd do a CPC deal, and then we'd drive traffic to the tour operators' websites. Uh, the problem was, uh, like most meta search, is that how do you know what actually is good traffic and what's bad traffic? And We'd send the bill to the tour operators each month and say, here's $1,000 of clicks, and they would ask straight back, how many bookings did I get for that? And so it was like, well, I don't know, did you track it? Did you have Google Analytics? Did you have anything? And I think that's the first point to make is that the touring industry is about 10 years behind the hotel industry. Uh, so they didn't have any idea about technology, uh, tracking, anything like that. Uh, and it was obviously very difficult to keep justifying ourselves that we were doing a good job and sending great traffic, um, but they just, you know, it was a constant battle. Um, along came Speed Invest in 2013. Uh, Eric Blatchford, also who's the uh, first CEO of Expedia, uh, he came on in the same round that Speed Invest came on, uh, and that was when we said, okay, we've tried everything with CPC, it's not really scaling, it's not really going anywhere, we're just battling the whole time how do we actually make this work? So we said, okay, transactional model is how we need to go. So that's where the, the marketplace idea basically uh, came out of. So I, I remember the first uh, board meetings and we were of course, uh, as good investors, we were looking at CACs and, and lifetime value. And I can tell from the first number of bookings at least that the CAC was as high as the basket size, if, if not higher. Um, <laughs> Which is probably a, a you know it's a normal thing in the beginning. You you start out and you you're acquiring your first customers and whatever. But um, um, I was thinking this morning when in the benchmark battery panel they were talking about um, inflated customer acquisition cost and sort of cooking the numbers a bit. Um, and then on the other hand, you need to fake it until you make it. Um, was there uh, what was your thinking about that? And was there any time during the journey where you where you probably spent too much on acquisition? That, wasn't really sustainable. So, yes, there was. Uh, simple answer. Uh, we had got things working. We, we basically had analytics. We, we thought we had a good handle on, on which traffic was working, which channels were working. Uh, and then we got pretty confident and thought, okay, let's, uh, let's try ramping spend. Uh, so we, we said, okay, next month, let's double it. Uh, and we actually doubled our AdWords spend from one month to the next. And yeah, it wasn't a good idea. Um, so <laughs> recommend not. Uh, it was, we learned lessons, we turned it off basically, we dialed back to what the level that we were at originally. And then we did a really big post-mortem on it. Uh, and what we realized was that we just weren't tracking enough. Uh, so in terms of, we had to track every single thing that happened on the site. So every referral, every UTM tracking code, but not just rely on Google Analytics. You had to actually track it in your own log files or you had to build your own system or have uh, a system that you buy. And that was something that we didn't have in place. And, and also around that time, uh, we were raising our next sort of round 
and one of the well-known VCs out of London gave us a, an email list about this long of all the data requests that they wanted and then we kind of looked at it and realised, shit, we haven't been tracking any of this. Uh, so then we actually got, went through the full list and actually put down all the things that we needed to track. We didn't know what we'd do with it, but we just thought, let's start tracking it and then eventually we will actually know what to do with it, hopefully. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, over time, uh, we started to understand and realise, okay, for a, a complex uh, product like ours, it's a, it's a long customer journey. So it's not like Deliveroo or Uber or anything like that where it's kind of a, a low basket size and high frequency. It's high basket, low frequency, and, and there's not a lot of case studies and, and businesses out there like that. So we started to look at other industries. So we said, okay, what other categories can we look at? So we looked at real estate, uh, so Zillow uh, here in the US. We looked at Redfin. Uh, then we actually looked at car. So buying a car is not something you do very often, uh, but it's a high purchase. So then we started to look at how did they do things. So we started to really analyze those and realize that you have to hold or actually see where in the funnel people are at. Because when we st first started marketing and that doubled spend that we did, basically we were hoping people would click and book a $2,000 experience. And of course that doesn't happen. Uh, so we had to break down what were the things, what were the micro moments or micro conversions in that journey that they were doing. And then working out how do we put marketing automation on the back of that. So if you actually look and go, okay, they're coming through, they're not going to book now, they're super top of funnel, but what marketing automation can I put in, in place that will get them across the line? It might not be tomorrow, it might not be in a week, but it'll be in three, four, maybe even two months time. Um, so that was kind of a key like, outcome from yeah, burning a lot of cash initially, uh, but then actually I think it made us really hone in and understand the, the underlying data uh, that we had, and then how do we realize which levers do we have within that data to actually start to, to market better. So, so the reason I guess why, why you put, um, why you chose attribution for the stock is because as, at least from the companies that I have seen, you have one of the most sophisticated attribution models. You're tracking across multiple channels, you're sort of trying to figure out where in the funnel is everyone. Um, that's also because uh, the product is complex, as you mentioned, and there's a long lead time. Can you give a bit of the, the insight, what, what is some of the thinking around moving people through the funnel and, and why you chose the attribution model that you chose and, and how you're tracking it. Um, maybe also going a bit into tools and software that you use because I, I figure you have a pretty sophisticated stack on that. Yep. So yeah, we started just collecting it in the MySQL database uh, to begin with, uh, just all the different information. Uh, and then, as we said, started to work out how do we actually do anything with this. So uh, Tableau was something that we connected uh, to the database and actually started to visualize what was actually happening. Uh, but the, the key part of that was the, the R funnel, so the Dave McClure, uh, AARRR, uh, and actually then started to look at each part of that. Uh, and people like to say, do some growth hacking on that, but that was actually super critical to look at, okay, this part, it's at the, the activation stage, they're super top of funnel, how do we focus for the next one week or three weeks or four weeks just experimenting on getting a higher activation rate or actually getting a, you know, a shorter time to purchase. So how do we get it from seven days from first touch to, to purchase down to five days or, or three days? Uh, and that's what we did a lot of growth hacking around um, to do that. Um, but in terms of the tools we actually had, uh, we looked at a lot of different options out there. So there's different ones from sale through, Marketo, HubSpot. Uh, there's a lot of things you can buy off the shelf. The problem for us was it, the nature of our product, uh, the complexity of it, our customers were from all over the world. It really wasn't a, a box solution that actually fitted how we could actually roll this out. Uh, so we decided this was a core competency of Tourradar and it was going to be a core competency going forward. So that's why we invested, uh, invest, uh, invested sorry, uh, into our own platform to actually do all this ourselves. Uh, um, so it was really, uh, we tried to buy a solution and the problem with that is also you've got to picture yourself if you are as successful as you hope you will be that you're locked into that provider. Like so you have to hope that that provider will still be there, they actually will still be around, 
they might change their business model, they might change the way that they're going. So you're completely locked into their kind of, you know, their destiny. And, and that was something that we weren't willing to take, the risk we weren't willing to take. Uh, so we started to, to actually do that ourselves. Um, but what we're actually doing now is that we're combining our own cookie tracking data and what we do is we're marrying devices now. So previously we just did one session and we only knew and understood the customer, what channel did they come from, what were they doing on the site, but now we're actually marrying up people based on user agents uh, from the browsers uh, and also by unique identifiers, let it be a, an email address or some other thing, uh, and we're actually marrying people up so we can track, okay, this person, they started their uh, journey on a, on a mobile device on the bus home from work, they were searching for kayaking tours in Costa Rica, 75 day, days later they actually came to us on their desktop with their girlfriend sitting next to them and they booked a different tour that they originally found. So, And that was the, the challenge we had was that you looked at Google AdWords and last click basis, just don't, we should have stopped. Like we actually, you know, back in the day, we were like, well, why are you still spending? And it's still like that today. If you look at last click, we shouldn't be spending what we're spending. But when we see the full journey of the customer, we know that say 75 days later, that person actually came on a different device from a different channel and then they booked. That is super valuable in terms of knowing when to scale. So. If you don't have that knowledge, you're basically blindly scaling something. Uh, and maybe for a, a small basket size product like Marketplace, you will see a click and book and you'll be able to use last click attribution pretty easily from analytics or AdWords. But if you've got a more complex uh, product and a bit higher basket size, I probably recommend doing something sort of on your own. Now, now I know that there's a lot of people, so your customer support team, and I know that a lot of people uh, call you once during the, the journey, um, just to see if you're there, if you really exist, right? Um, so I, I wonder how you come up with all the investors, they'll ask for CACs, and how do you come up with that number? Because if you, if it is like you described, that there's so many channels involved and, and so many uh, ads also involved, what, what, how, how do you actually calculate that? So we ended up using the multi-touch attribution model. Uh, we tried modeling everything on first touch, last touch, uh, all the different ones. Multi-touch made the most sense and, and what we did on the, on the paid side of things was that we actually looked at how many bookings in that given month touched AdWords, for example. And then we'd, we'd add up that there was 70,000 touch points or whatever the number was. We'd take the amount we spent and then we'd actually calculate, okay, how much was every single one of those touch points worth? Uh, so if that particular booking had four AdWords touch points, it'd be four times one euro or whatever it is. Uh, so we'd then actually work out how does that, and that's what we did for each of the channels. Obviously, organic is, uh, is free, so to speak, um, but for all the paid channels, uh, it actually really clearly starts to show you which, which are working and which aren't. Um. Yeah, if you would, um, out of all the stuff that you learned, um, distill one thing that is most valuable, one detour or one, one wrongdoing that you did, what would it be? Uh, how would you solve attribution? If you could solve it again, um, how would you solve it immediately? What was the thing that was most valuable? That wasn't on the plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I'd probably say, it's, it is actually understanding the, the, the customer journey properly uh, before you actually really invest into, into scaling marketing. Like, and that's something kind of what I, what I said is I, we thought we had an idea of it, but until you really dig into it and actually break something, like, so like we did where you just ramped up the spend, uh, you don't kind of yeah realize what you don't know until you actually break it. Uh, so I think you've got to be bold to make those uh, you know, where you do actually push things and, and break it, but to learn fast after that um, and actually pull back and actually do a proper post-mortem diagnosis of what's going on uh, and then actually yeah realizing where you basically messed up and then kind of moving forward and don't make that same mistake again. Great. Um, we got time to take some questions from the audience. So, uh, uh, did you? When people go to your site, are they logged in? Are they authenticated? Or are you tying them using email address by like printing a string? Like 
So the question where people are authenticated when they come on the site? It's a mixture of both. Uh, so yeah, people can log in, uh, but also that's something in uh, UTM tracking codes. You can put the email address of the customer from an email. So if they're on their mobile device, they click, they actually then, you track that in the URL. Um, now, with GDPR and everything that's going on in Europe, you have to put that in a hash, uh, so it's actually not visible, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the way we're actually tracking it now. Any other questions? Yeah. So how does the, uh, how does, does the working together with the customer service work? Because I remember uh, this was one of the critical issues that actually your supply side, so to say, the two operators were not available in, in, in real time, so to say. So what we did was we built a 24-7 customer support team. Uh, that's something especially, so we work with tour operators who are global companies and have 24-7, but most don't. So these are a local provider in Mexico or somewhere in Namibia. So they're working their nine to five uh, for, for their hours. Uh, so what we did was we built uh, a team in Vienna, uh, the headquarters. We also had Toronto. And we've got Brisbane, uh, where we actually have kind of a, a nice 24-7, uh, 9 to 5 kind of uh, office hours. Uh, and that works well in terms of the customer always has someone to reach. So whilst the tour operator is not available, we're there to typically we can find the answers. So the, the customer support person can go to the website of the operator whilst they're on the call. Uh, they can actually, we've got like a knowledge base of Q&As uh, that the CS team can actually search as well. Um, and those things put the, the answers at their fingertips. So we could be getting the answers to the, the customers at two in the morning US time uh, if they wanted it. And, and it's actually what we're seeing. We see random people at literally two in the morning in Australia booking a $4,000 tour. Um, so I don't know what they're doing, if they're drunk or anything like that, <laughs> but uh, they're actually, it's really weird the times that people are actually booking these, these crazy expensive tours. Yeah. How did you end up um, coming up with sort of the full picture of customer acquisition and what that journey was, was like from, you know, from being on the bus to looking up the different tour at home? Was it only when you built out that entire proprietary backend that you could really get that full picture or were there other tools earlier? Yeah, so we did the kind of get the uh, poster on the wall and we mapped out the, the customer journey as best we could. Uh, but from the, the data point of view, it was only when we could track every channel and see, it's only when you realize that they're actually visiting three or four unique channels before they're coming across the line and actually putting their credit card down. Um, and before that, we only had a gut feeling of, okay, they are using search or they are using social at top of funnel, but it was only when we fully had that picture that we could actually see they came from, from social, they came from email, but email was always the one basically bringing them back. Um, so yeah, email is a super important channel, which I think is massively underestimated by so many people. Uh, and if you're not using email and it's relevant for your business, then I'd really kind of recommend uh, leveraging email uh, as much as you can. One, one other thing I'd probably mention is around what started out as, as more of just tracking and attribution and understanding the customer has now led us to a, a product which is, we've got the first version of our recommendation coming out. Uh, we've got basically a ton of stuff now we can leverage because we've got that base data in place. Uh, so it's, it's helped with the marketing automation, but now the future of yeah, the whole Amazon, you've looked at this and now you can look at this. We're tracking everything of the customer so we can actually start to provide much better on-site recommendations, changing the algorithm of the, the listings pages, but also in the emails. So we can be sending much more targeted one-to-one -one emails rather than just blanket kind of spamming uh, once a week to all Australians, for example. What's maybe also interesting that I, I would say it, it, it led even to more um, in supply and demand. Um, so maybe you want to talk about the Asland experience or something where you actually try to come up with what's the demand for a certain supply and can we build that out? Yeah, um, yeah so we started out, uh, every marketplace has one thing you start, supply and demand. We started with supply, we onboarded a bunch of it. Uh, we thought we had 500 tour operators and that was enough to provide us with what we needed. 
but when we started to put a focus on onboarding very good quality supply in a certain region like Iceland uh, about a year and a half ago, um, it really does drive demand. Uh, like it, they, you kind of get told it, and I was told in early days by some of the investors, look, supply is super important. I'm like, well, we've got tons of supply. We don't need it. We just need to get more customers to the site. But when you actually get the right tour operators, so for us, uh, with the right price point, great listings, great <coughs> photos, reviews, all the things that kind of give that proof to get them across the line, that was started to actually drive demand. And that's a strategy we're implementing more and more and rolling and, and pushing into new corridors and new destinations uh, where supply is leading that, actually. Which for me is a very interesting way of looking at it because you think that, you know, I'm, I'm onboarding supply, but actually you're onboarding a very specific supply based on measured demand, based on, on attribution and everything. Um, maybe to close this off, just a, 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 maybe someone has a, another question. I'll have a, a quick one in between. What's the longest tour and the most expensive tour on the platform? <laughs> the longest is 365 days. Uh, and it goes from London to Sydney. Uh, so basically overland, over through Iran and, and down through Asia. And then a bus, uh, oh, sorry, a, a ferry that you get, but it's from Bali, I think it is, down to Sydney. Uh, the most expensive, I believe, is $150,000, uh, which is a polar expedition. Uh, so I think it's like to the Antarctic. Uh, but the most expensive tour we've sold is a $55,000 uh, river cruise for one person. <laughs> it's a very lonely person with a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> One last question before we close this off. Thank you. Then thank you, Travis.